Before the video begins, I'd like to say thank you to the people who support me on Patreon. Every one of you who watch these videos is much appreciated, and I wouldn't be making them without you. But at this point in my life, the Patreons are putting food on the table and keeping a roof over my head. So I do say thank you very much for that. Now with that out of the way, let's dive into this video. In 2017, 29-year-old Ethan Davis lived with his brother and parents on a 400-acre farm in Promise City, Iowa. The man is described by a friend as a prepper, someone who holds a belief that any individual shouldn't leave their fate to chance if things turn sour. For example, if the electrical grid goes down, or if the government closes for extended periods of time. In these instances, a prepper believes in being completely self-reliant with stashes of preserved food, ammunition, and many ways to navigate the world in the event of a crisis like this. Ethan is a father to a one-and-a-half-year-old son with his ex-girlfriend. In November of 2017, the two were no longer a couple and were having troubles with their co-parenting. This had led to a miscommunication between the two, one where Ethan believed that he would have his son over Thanksgiving weekend. But on the day of Thanksgiving, his ex is not answering her phone, and he doesn't get to see his son. Frustrated, on the day of Thanksgiving, Ethan drives to his friend Joseph's house. Joseph describes his guest as being very upset for a few reasons. One, his recent breakup. Two, he lost his job and three, the situation overall with his child was very upsetting to him. After hanging out with Joseph all day and night, Ethan returns home at midnight. The next day, which is a Friday, Ethan leaves home to buy some cigarettes. Upon doing so, as he's driving away from the store, he spots his ex-girlfriend Shayla's vehicle at her new boyfriend's house, a man by the name of Jarvis Kennebec. Ethan says he knew that his ex would use drugs such as methamphetamines with her new boyfriend, and he was worried about his son's safety being in this house. Because there was no court order for custody over the child, Ethan and Shayla would work out amongst themselves who could have the boy and at what times, and generally they would do this week by week. Because of this, and the concerns he has for his son being inside of this property, Ethan decides to approach to look inside. The place is described, using Ethan's words, as a crack house. And as he looks through the window, he claims to have seen his son laying on the floor unattended, with a pit bull running around him. Ethan quickly enters the house and picks up the child, and it's at this point that Shayla and Jarvis exit the bathroom together. Ethan alleges that his ex was holding a meth pipe, but she denies this. She says she had not used methamphetamines or marijuana in the days leading up to this. In fact, she's never used any of that when her son had been in her care. Shayla and Jarvis rush Ethan and grab at the child, but Ethan pushes them back. During this struggle, Ethan unholsters his 9mm handgun, points it at Jarvis, then at Shayla, then aims it at the roof and fires one round upwards, leaving a hole in the ceiling. Here is a quote from Ethan regarding what happened. And the third time Shayla tried to grab my son from me, I pulled the pistol and I held it at both of them. And that's... They didn't want to stop. They just wanted to keep coming. They was out of their mind. That's when I let off the round in the ceiling and they laid back. The whole time the dog was running around me and chased me outside. And when I got in the car, Shayla was there. She ran outside. She grabbed me a few times. I tried to push her back with my arm. I grabbed the Hummer door and tried to close it, and she was in the way. And this went on for maybe 10, 15 seconds. And finally, I let go of the door, and I thought, she must have knocked herself out with it. She was yanking on it so hard, and she just went to the ground. That's when I left. End quote. During this altercation, it is learned that Ethan had struck Jarvis in the face, using his weapon before firing that round into the roof. At 11.42am, after Ethan drives away, Shayla contacts 911 to report this incident, and the law enforcement go on the lookout for his vehicle. A distinctive orange Hummer, with a very loud muffler, and it was missing its rear windshield. Now with his child in tow, Ethan heads back to the family farm, he takes back streets and gravel roads to avoid the police, 
As he suspected, 911 had been called. Once he gets to the farm, he attempts to leave his son with his parents, but they aren't home. A few days earlier, Ethan had left his cell phone at a cousin's house, so he had no way to contact people. He drives to a few other places nearby of friends and family, but all of these people were not home either. Feeling anxious that he's soon going to be arrested, he really wants to get his son somewhere safe. Eventually, Ethan ends up at Joseph's house, the friend he stayed with until midnight the night before. Joseph says that Ethan erratically drove up into his backyard, and this was not normal behavior for the man. Ethan was more upset than Joseph had ever seen before. He was fast talking, and it appeared as though he had been crying. Ethan is at the house for less than 90 seconds, and in this time leaves the child who is asleep on the living room floor. He writes down his mother's phone number for Joseph to call, then at 1.05 p.m., jumps back into the Hummer and speeds away. Joseph calls Ethan's mother, and 10 minutes later she arrives to collect the child. From this point on, Ethan is not seen again until 5 p.m. the next day. This now brings us to a part of the story where we look at someone who has absolutely nothing to do with Ethan and his situation. The man's name is Curtis Ross. 31-year-old Curtis Ross had never met Ethan and has zero ties to the story so far. Curtis is an avid hunter from northwest Iowa. He would frequently come to Promise City where he would stay with his friend William and the two would go hunting together. Curtis was especially fond of a public hunting ground which he named Narnia, and on this Thanksgiving weekend, he had come to visit William, to spend time with his friend, and to go to those hunting grounds. On the day after Thanksgiving, Friday, Curtis had stayed at William's house, and they had had dinner together the night before. In the early morning hours Friday, they both go to separate hunting grounds, and they planned to meet up later in the day at the house. William gets home first at around 10am and takes a nap, and Curtis returns shortly after. Soon after Curtis gets back to the house, the two discuss their afternoon plans, and Curtis mentions that he'll be going to Narnia. William sees Curtis leave the house, and they both had planned to meet up later on at night back at the house. At 1.38pm on Friday, Curtis sends a Snapchat to multiple people showing his hunting gear, and someone replies to him at 1.59pm, but this message was never opened. Near the public hunting grounds where Curtis was set up, around 2.30pm, a local resident is washing his truck. Whilst doing this, he hears several rapid-fire gunshots ring out. They were so close to him, he says, that he took cover, believing his life was in danger. At 3.30pm, William tries to contact Curtis via text message, but there is no response. At 5.30pm, he sends Curtis a Snapchat, but again, no response. William begins to worry, and checks for his friend at a local bar, but with no luck. Curtis had not come in that day. William searches into the early hours of Saturday morning, checking local areas, stores, and when he goes to the public hunting grounds that Curtis said he would be, William does see his friend's vehicle parked. He shouts out for Curtis multiple times, but with no response, and it's at this point he decides it's time to contact the police. A search begins that night, but it is said to be difficult because of the heavily wooded area and complete pitch black of the night. At 8am Saturday morning, an officer a part of the search team spots something out in a creek. It's a naked human body, deceased and submerged right in the middle of the body of water. Once the person is retrieved, it is confirmed to be Curtis Ross. The man had been mutilated, shot ten times, and some of them at extreme close range. Gunshot wounds were also found on his chest, shoulders, arms, hips and legs. He had sustained 26 plunging stab wounds. Multiple organs were damaged, including his lungs, liver, kidneys, diaphragm, and intestines. Two of the stab wounds were to his neck, both six inches deep, and they had severed his carotid arteries. There was also five extensive incision wounds carved into his body. Four of them were on his legs, one on each thigh and one on each calf. The coroner indicated that many of these were sustained whilst he was alive. It is unclear which was the fatal wound, and it is said that many of these wounds on their own were considered fatal. An investigation commences immediately, and evidence is gathered from the crime scene. 
It is important to note that Curtis was found completely naked, and none of his items of clothing or hunting gear were ever recovered. What was found, though, were some items and locations of interest around where Curtis's body had been found. Several spent ammunition casings were located near the creek and two other areas nearby. Another location where spent casings were found was a grassy area close by to the creek. This spot was of most interest because there was blood covering some of the plants, the blood determined to be Curtis's. More of these casings were found on a hilltop area that overlooks the creek and the grassy patch where Curtis's blood was found. On this hill, a makeshift hunting blind had been constructed. It appeared to have been freshly cut and had a direct line of sight to the bloody grass patch. Curtis's blood was also found in two more areas, one near the waterline of the creek, and another in a separate grassy patch, 20 feet from the creek. This area also contained some of Curtis's bone fragments, two spent shell casings, a metal bullet tip, and a camouflaged elastic tie. This area was connected to the bloody patch that I had mentioned earlier by a trail of blood, suggesting that Curtis was dragged from one location to the other before being dumped into the creek. Further evidence was uncovered near the crime scene. A rusty old refrigerator was discovered, and inside there were multiple gun magazines, the same ammunition as what was found near the crime scene. These were sent to the lab, and it was discovered that a man by the name of Ethan Davies had his fingerprints present on some of these items. It also was of interest to law enforcement that these public hunting grounds were connected to a private country farm property belonging to the parents of Ethan Davies, only 2.5 miles away from the crime scene. Because of these connections, a search warrant is obtained and police go to search the farm. During this search, an AR-15 is uncovered, hidden underneath a parked hay mower. This rifle was purchased and owned by Ethan. The gun is sent to a crime lab, and Curtis's blood is identified in multiple locations on it. Some of these spots included the scope lens and the butt plate. Ethan's fingerprints are all over the weapon, and to add to it all, the gun was determined by experts to have been the very rifle that fired multiple bullets, which had casings located around the scene. Ethan is charged with first-degree murder and enters a plea of not guilty. In early February of 2019, a jury trial takes place. Ethan takes the stand at a point during this six-day trial, and he testifies to what occurred in the time period after he left his son at his friend Joseph's house on the Friday afternoon, all the way up until the next day when his parents saw him come home at 5pm. Ethan says that he drove away from Joseph's house and parked his Hummer in a somewhat remote location on his parents' property, a spot between a cornfield and a timberline. He says that he hid out there because he knew that an arrest was inevitable due to his actions earlier in the day. He was not yet ready to face this situation, so he wanted to spend time alone in the woods whilst he came to terms with it all. During the trial, Ethan's parents confirmed that this was typical behaviour for their son. They said since he was a child, he had often gone off by himself for a day or two to think about things if he felt overwhelmed or upset. Ethan claims that during this time period where Curtis was murdered, he had never once entered the public hunting grounds and stayed only within the confines of his parents' property. He said that all he did in that time was chain smoke cigarettes and listen to music in his vehicle. The only time he ventured away from the Hummer was to walk to a nearby church where he prayed for a few hours, then he returned to his car to sleep in it overnight. The next day, which was Saturday, Ethan states that he remained at and around the parked Hummer until the evening, around 5pm, where he walked back to his parents' house. When he gets to the farmhouse, his parents and cousins were there, and it's at this point that he tells them about the incident where he fired a bullet into the roof of his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend's property. With his family's encouragement, Ethan decides to go to the police to turn himself in for having done that. On the stand, Ethan admits to owning ammo cans, gun magazines, and the AR-15 which was used in the murder. He acknowledges that it was his weapon that likely killed Curtis but he says that it was not him who pulled the trigger. 
He believes that the weapon was likely stolen from the back of his vehicle at some point earlier in the month. He says that he kept the weapon in the back of his car, and many people knew that it was there. Because he was missing the rear windshield, someone could have easily reached in and grabbed it. He says that especially his ex and her cohorts, whom he describes as felons and addicts, they could have easily taken the weapon and used it to frame him. Ethan claims that he didn't even know the gun was missing from the back of his car until it was located at his property under the haymower. He then builds onto the story by saying he does believe that someone wanted to frame him, and they had deliberately placed the murder weapon at his farmhouse property after doing the killing. The defense team for Ethan would claim that although the evidence linking his weapon to the crime is pretty convincing, there's just not enough there to place the man as the one who pulled the trigger that day. They would say that although Ethan's fingerprints were on some of the articles of evidence, things such as magazine cartridges and the gun itself, there were also a second set of prints left by an unidentified person. Furthermore, of the six magazines recovered from the rusty old refrigerator, only two of them could be used in an AR-15, and neither of those cartridges contained Ethan's prints. They say that although the rifle itself contained his fingerprints, it didn't have any of his DNA on it, yet it did hold the DNA of three separate people, none of whom have been identified. Police had discovered a large number of distinctive footprints near the refrigerator stash, footprints that were left by a specialized, barefoot-style shoe that separates the toes. Similar prints were also located in the area between Curtis's parked truck and the crime scene, but no such shoes were ever located or linked to Ethan. Along these lines, a cart tire impression was left near the location of Curtis's body, yet nothing that could make this print was ever found around Ethan's property, in his possession, or in his Hummer. The defense says that all of this shows there are more people that should be suspects here, and because Ethan is the only one who has identifiable prints, that's not enough to eliminate reasonable doubt that there could be someone else who has the potential to commit this crime. They continue to build on this idea by presenting Ethan's father to the stand. He tells the jury that on Monday afternoon he had found a camouflage backpack on his property which contained items such as numerous magazine cartridges, a tactical vest with green-tipped ammunition, and an empty gun case. This was located near a grain silo, and Ethan's father is adamant that it was not there the day prior on Sunday. He says that someone had planted it, and it was impossible for his son to have done this. The defense says that despite what must have been a gruesome and messy scene, no blood or DNA belonging to Curtis was ever found in Ethan's vehicle or on any of his clothes or shoes. The state, on the other hand, would say that Ethan was absolutely the one who committed the crime, that he was in a state of paranoid-induced panic, hiding out in the woods and keenly staying alert, watching for law enforcement as he anxiously tried to hide from what was ultimately going to be his arrest. Whilst in this headspace and hiding, he spots the hunting Curtis. Ethan either mistakes this man for law enforcement, or panics that if he is discovered by the hunter, they could reveal his location to the police. So he goes into a frenzy and brutally murders Curtis. During closing statements, the prosecutor took issue with the defense's argument that some unknown person had intentionally framed Ethan for the killing. They would say, quote, Who would do it? Who would frame Ethan Davies? Give me a name. This would require that someone stole Ethan's gun without him knowing, and then killed Ross at the exact same time Ethan was in hiding due to being on the run from law enforcement. The perpetrator would then had to have snuck onto the Davies' property without being seen to plant the gun that had Ethan's fingerprints and Ross's blood on it. End quote. It would seem that the defense's argument didn't hold up. The jury comes to the conclusion of guilty. Ethan Davies is sentenced to life in prison. It's at this point of the video I've transitioned away from court document research and now speak from my own opinions and thoughts on this case. The question, did Ethan do this murder or not? 
I mean, I'm of the opinion that he absolutely did. The prosecutor's argument that this unknown individual who stole the weapon from his vehicle weeks in advance, only to somehow figure out, or possibly by the most unbelievable coincidence ever, that Ethan was going to randomly be camping out in these woods on this very day that a random hunter was going to be making their way through them. They then went on to kill and mutilate this hunter, which would have taken hours upon grueling hours. Then, they quickly scrambled over to the farm, and avoiding everyone's eyesight, planted multiple articles of evidence over the span of three days. To me, it's pretty unbelievable when it's broken down like that, hey. I'm not buying it. This brings my thoughts, though, to the actual incident itself. Removing, for just a brief moment, the human element that Curtis lost his life, and looking at it from a more mechanical perspective. Something that I do find fascinating about this case, is how the hunter had become the hunted. I imagine Curtis to be a confident and experienced hunter, one who had been known to teach others how to both hunt and survive out in the wilderness. As he was making his way through the woods, I don't imagine for a second that he would have considered that there was a target on his back. Ethan, sitting atop a hill, watching him through a scoped lens, observing, hunting. Curtis, the apex predator, did not see this one coming. Who knows why Ethan pulled that trigger. It was tough to find background information on the man, and other than a few minor traffic infringements, I couldn't unearth anything of eyebrow-raising quality. So what would make this somewhat normal individual turn into a premeditating, cold-blooded predator? Possibly a state of paranoid, violent psychosis. He spotted Curtis making his way through the woods, and lost control due to rage, fear, and frustration. He refocused all of the attention that he had placed on self-pity, and the hopeless feeling of loss surrounding many elements of his life and he put it all onto this new target of eliminating a threat. Whatever the reason may be, an innocent man lost his life, and that is something that I don't want to glance over. By all reports, he seemed like a genuinely good person. Here is some information that I dug up regarding who the human being that Curtis Ross is. One of Curtis's friends would say, quote, You immediately felt like you knew him all your life. He was an excellent hunter, and easily made friends with everyone around. He was an all-round good dude." End quote. Written on his obituary were these words, Kurt was a loving son, brother, and uncle. He was an avid outdoorsman, enjoying many sports such as game hunting, fishing, golf, pool, and baseball. His best pal was his chocolate lab, Avery. Kurt Ross worked hard and played hard, he had a zest for life, a quick wit and a casual smile. He nurtured his friendships and loved his family. Kurt dreamt of owning acres of land to build a home and to have his own wildlife oasis. He has gone there now, and his dreams are his reality in heaven. An interview with his mother would have her saying this about Curtis. Curtis wanted those around him to be happy, and he didn't like conflict or confrontations. Whenever he knew I was struggling or something, he'd say, Mum, why are you crabby today? And then he'd say something like, Well, you know, if it gets too bad, I've got the reservation at the nursing home all made. I just have to drop you off. He liked everybody to be happy, and he had a great sense of humour. He wanted everyone to always have a good time, and he would have been a really good father. Given the chance... He would have been a great dad someday. His funeral brought individuals from all across the country. People we didn't even know. Anybody who probably met Kurt, liked Kurt. Unless they were picking on somebody of Kurt's. He always had your back. About a year before he was killed, a business venture Curtis was attempting fell through. In his journal, he wrote, Some days I swear my life is a movie. If it's not, it should be. Curveball after curveball. I can't get mad. I can't get too happy. I can't give up. You're going to get that fastball down the middle sooner or later. Life is full of lessons, no matter how long it takes you to learn them. 